rhyme, whose author has long since been forgotten, runs, Living above with the saints we love, oh, that will be glory. Living below with the saints we know, well, that's a different story. There are a good number of people who have a love-hate relationship with Jesus and the church. They love Jesus and hate the church. When I encounter such people, I have to admit to feeling some sympathy for them. People who identify themselves as Christian can be petty, hypocritical, inconsistent, self-righteous, intolerant, divisive. The list could go on, and so far, I'm just describing myself at my worst moments. As communities of Christians, we have a difficult time living up to the ideals held up for us in our scriptures, though I suspect that a good deal of the problem stems from a lack of clear awareness of what those ideals are and clear commitment to helping one another live up to those ideals. Christ and his apostles regarded the community of believers as God's gift to each believer, and each believer as God's gift to the community of believers. If we enjoy only cordial but superficial relationships with one another in our churches, if we invest ourselves but lightly in one another's lives, if we keep up our boundaries and allow other Christians to invest but lightly in our lives, we are missing out on and causing our sisters and brothers to miss out on one of the greatest and most important resources that Christ has given us to sustain us in our lives and help us live more fully into discipleship. And that gift is, simply, one another. Recovering the practice of community that matches the New Testament vision for the same will require us to swim hard against some strong cultural currents that have flooded Christian thinking and practice for a long time. We need to push a great deal of our individualism aside and recover the central importance of the group and of the others who constitute this group. A place to begin is with the New Testament images for those who are in Christ. I am struck by the fact that these are all collective images, showing that God's concern is not just with saving me or transforming me, but is rather always with saving an us, transforming an us. These images allow me no room for an I can take them or leave them attitude when it comes to the people who gather alongside me to worship, to study, and to serve. Rather, these images drive me toward accepting significant responsibility to and for those people. Starting with the teachings of Jesus himself, we find the image of Christ followers as a new family. We are instructed throughout the New Testament to give one another the level of attention, commitment, and investment that people would normally reserve for blood relatives. Because we have become brothers and sisters who are genuinely related by blood, namely, the blood of Jesus. Honoring those connections, those bonds that Jesus created, is a necessary part of honoring the blood that he poured out to forge them in the first place. Another image is that of a building, with each one of us supplying merely one living stone to the much greater edifice that is the spiritual temple that God has been fitting together to be God's own dwelling place. While, yes, the Holy Spirit dwells within me. The Holy Spirit indwells all who are in Christ, and it is all of us together that God has sanctified to be God's temple. God has thus made coming together as a church, not just in a church, but as a church, an indispensable part of experiencing God's own presence.
A third image is that of a single body, a biological organism that has many parts, each part doing what it does to benefit the whole, each part indispensable to the whole if the whole is to flourish, each part inseparable from the whole if the part is to remain alive. Paul urged each believer to think of himself or herself as more akin to a hand or an eye or a liver, vital when embedded in and working as part of the whole, but just so much biological waste if disconnected from the whole. In a culture accustomed to self-promotion and competition, Paul urged believers to understand the interdependence that God and God's wisdom had ordained for those who would be in Christ, who would not carry their society's mindset into the new beloved community, but would rather live from the mind of Christ toward one another. In all of these images, the focus of God's redemptive action falls not on me living out my faith well, but on us living out our faith well in a coordinated fashion with one another. God's vision is a vision for an us and not a me. Those who can say that they can be Christian without going to church, that is, without coming together as a church, and those who believe that their faith is a private matter between me and God, have either rejected or not grasped the gospel of the New Testament. This vision is part of the DNA of churches in the Wesleyan tradition. John Wesley recognized the importance of individual disciples experiencing the regular support, encouragement, prayer, and accountability of other disciples and of offering the same to them. If any of these disciples were to enjoy the progress toward entire sanctification, that was God's desire and purpose for them. The writers of our baptismal liturgies recognize the same as at every baptism. It is not merely the candidates who make promises, but the whole congregation. The pastor asks the congregation, will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include these persons now before you in your care? we respond with our own promise before God to the newest disciples. With God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround these persons with a community of love and forgiveness that they may grow in their trust of God and be found faithful in their service to others. We will pray for them that they may be true disciples who walk in the way that leads to life. We promise to be the sort of friends, indeed, the sort of family for them, that will move them to trust God more and more and will help keep them steady in their own investment of themselves in the lives of others. We promise to hold their continued progress toward holiness before God in prayer invoking God's favor and help, and listening for ways in which God would position us to be the help that God would offer. And where we genuinely live out this pledge, we begin to reflect the kind of community that the New Testament writers so passionately wanted Christ's followers to be for one another. And we begin to understand and experience why this collective dimension of Christian practice is indeed gospel, indeed good news for those whom the Holy Spirit has inseparably joined, not merely for a Sunday morning or even for this life, but for eternity.